Great, thank you. Um, thanks to our CVS Knowledge for inviting me. Although, as usual, I'm now regretting that, uh, accepting that invitation. But <coughs> my name's Tim Mayer. I'm a horse vet, basically. I work at Bell Equine Veterinary Clinic in Kent. I'm also editor of a journal, Equine Veterinary Education, which is a postgraduate educational journal of the British Equine Veterinary Association and the American Association of Equine Practitioners. So my remit is to talk about how to critically appraise a paper and how to run a journal club. Um, I think the critical appraisal of papers, of course, is integral to the, the practice of evidence-based veterinary medicine. But as practitioners, including myself, sometimes when you are trying to appraise uh, scientific studies, it can be a bit of a daunting task, especially when there's lots of complicated <laughs> or unfamiliar statistics involved. Um, but in most cases, if we use a fairly common sense approach and a systematic approach, then it's possible to appraise most of the literature and most of the papers that we may want to assess in the, in the veterinary sphere. So we're all familiar with this diagram. We all know that evidence-based medicine involves the integration of our individual clinical expertise with the patient values or client values and expectations and the best external evidence available. And in order to practice evidence-based medicine, we need to ask clinical questions, we need to find the evidence uh, in the literature, we need to read the, those papers, decide on its quality and relevance, and that's what we're going to concentrate on this, on this talk. And then, where appropriate, incorporate that into our clinical practice or our clinical decision making. So critical appraisal then really involves a very careful reading of a paper. And we're doing this for a number of reasons. We want to identify bias or error. That is, we want to assess the validity of that study. We want to know whether the conclusions or results generated from the study are real, believable, whether we can use those in our, in our practice or not. We have to try and understand the significance and the magnitude of the results. And there may be a difference between statistical significance and clinical significance. <coughs> So just because something is statistically significant doesn't necessarily mean it's of clinical significance. So we need to try and assess that. And then we need to assess whether the knowledge, the results gained from reading the study <coughs> can be applied to our own patients and our own practice. And that's called generalizability and applicability. So when I'm appraising an article, this, I tend to use these five elements, these five areas that I concentrate my, uh, my, my opinion on. Firstly, and it's important to answer what is the research question. Secondly, we want to look at the design of the study, and we'll talk about study design because it is important to understand the various different types of study design because they all have an effect on the validity of the study and the, what, how useful the results are going to be. So the third area and the biggest area is to assess the study's validity. That is, can I believe the results? Is the conclusions appropriate? Can I use these results to, in my own practice? Um, because they are true. Then we assess the study's results itself, and then we assess the study's generalizability and applicability. So we'll go for, through each of these five elements. So the first question is, what is the research question? Why was this study done? What question are the researchers trying to answer? Now, you usually find this in the abstract or in the introduction. But it's somewhere in the study, we would hope it would actually say why the study is being done in the first place. And for most well-designed studies, you can formulate that question into a PICO format, which I'm sure people you will be familiar with. But PICO basically divides that question up into the patient or population that's being studied, the intervention or exposure that is being studied, and then some, what you're comparing that this group that's had that intervention or exposure with. So we have a comparative group and then the outcome. So it's, it should be possible to, to break this, this study question up into this PICO format in most cases. Some studies will have secondary questions and outcomes. Sometimes it's quite confusing. Sometimes you don't actually know why the study is being done or you don't know what the primary question was. Uh, you can't see the wood for the trees sometimes. So, but it's important always to try and establish in your mind, if it's not absolutely clear, what was the primary aim of the study? Of the study what was the, the question they were trying to answer? And then we need to look at study design, and we'll look at different study designs as we go through. But we can divide the different studies into various groups, so we have evidence syntheses. These are studies which bring together other studies 
uh, and analyse the other studies to try and come to some consensus opinion based on other types of studies that have all been done in this particular area or this particular question. And they will involve systematic reviews and knowledge summaries or critically appraised topics or best bets for vets, they have various names. But these are all evidence synthesis type of studies. Then there are experimental studies, and in most cases we're going to look at controlled trials. They may be randomised or they may not be randomised. And then there are observational studies. So these are epidemiological type studies. They include cohort studies, case control studies, cross-sectional studies. And, but it's important to remember that the best study design will depend on the type of question. So it is important to understand these study designs because depending <laughs> on what the question is, one or different study design may be more or less appropriate. So <clears throat> we've determined what the question was, we've determined what the study design is, we then have to assess the validity of the study and this is probably the most important part of the appraisal process. So validity refers to the degree to which a study accurately reflects or assesses the specific concept that the researcher is attempting to measure. In other words, it's assessing how well the study was performed, designed, undertaken to answer the question that they posed in the first place. So we need to look at whether the study conducted so that the results, can we believe the results? It's really trying to assess whether we believe the study is valid, whether the results are believable, whether they're appropriate, or whether there's some flaw in the study design which means we can't really trust those results. So we're really in, in this part of the, the appraisal, we're searching for bias. So we define bias as a systematic error or a deviation from the truth or the conclusion. So in other words, the results of the study are erroneous and unbelievable to varying degrees because of some error in the process of, of performing the study. And bias can creep in in a whole different er number of different areas in study design. So in our sampling methods, in our methods of data collection, in our methods of statistical analysis, in the methods of reporting, all of these areas are open to errors and bias, which then affects the results and affects how well we can believe the results. So any error in any of these processes, any bias in area, any of these areas, will result in either an underestimation or an overestimation of the actual truth. Of course, it's going to vary in magnitude, magnitude depending on how, what type of bias we're talking about. Um, and remember also that different types of study design are, dis are susceptible to different types of bias, which again goes back to why it's important to understand what the study design is. But in terms of bias, there are three main areas that we usually concentrate on. These are the three most important areas where bias can creep into a study. And that's selection bias, performance bias, and detection bias. So in selection bias, it's where we select the individuals or the groups or the data for analysis that we, in the study. So it's where the selection is in such a way that the sample obtained is not representative of the population that we were intending to study. So we, if we're doing a study on heart disease in dogs uh, and we select our group of, of patients, we need to be sure that that selection process is actually producing a sample of dogs with heart disease that is appropriate and is going to be um, consistent with what's happening in the general population of dogs with, with heart disease. Then performance bias, this is where there are differences between the groups in the care provided. So in a controlled trial we have two groups of dogs with heart disease, one group has treatment A, one group has treatment B and we're comparing the results. Unless we treat those groups exactly the same way apart from that intervention, then there's going to be bias. So there's going to be errors in the, in the results um, because of exposure of certain one group to certain factors that weren't present in the other group. Uh, and therefore it's going to affect uh, the validity and the accuracy of the results. And then last is the detection bias where there's differences between the groups in how the outcomes are, are actually determined or assessed. So how we actually get the results from those two groups of dogs with heart disease, it needs to be exactly the same. There can't be any differences between those two groups in how we're actually assessing the results. Then briefly mentioned poor reporting. So most of the studies that we're likely to read in the, in the veterinary literature will be peer reviewed. 
And the purpose of peer review is to make sure that the study design is, is well, it's well designed and the study is valid. But peer review is not uh, faultless. There are problems with the peer review process and you can't rely on the fact that the, uh, the paper is peer reviewed that it's going to be a valid study. You've got to determine that yourself. There may be missing descriptions um, for the type of animals, for example, used in the study, or no clear description of the diagnostic methods used. So in our journal club, we, yesterday we looked at a paper assessing a condition in horses called overriding dorsal spinous processes, or kissing spines as it's commonly known, uh, and it assessed their treatment for this disease. But there was no clear description of how they actually came to the diagnosis in the first place which means that actually you can't really rely on this study because we don't know what population of horses they were treating. There may be inappropriate documentation of treatments and outcome measurements. So anywhere where there's a lack of information that you need to appraise that study means that it limits our ability to, to accurately cri and critically appraise that, that information. <coughs> and an invalid study may not be worth reading. So when I'm, and a lot of people, when they're critically appraising a study, rather than start at the abstract and go for the introduction or jump to the summary or whatever, it's the materials and methods section that's the most important one to concentrate on. That will give you all the information you need to decide whether you think this study is worth reading or not, whether you think it's going to be a valid study and whether the results are going to be reliable and usable. If you don't think from the materials and methods that this was a study that was well designed or performed or there's bias or it's not valid, then there's really no point in reading it. We all have information overload. We're all bombarded with studies and information. You've got to pick and choose and choose the ones you think are going to be most useful. And the easiest way of doing that is to assess the materials and methods. So once we've done through, been through that process, then we can look at the results. And this is where we sometimes face a problem with statistics. And it's certainly in my case, and I think a lot of clinicians' cases, we don't really understand. We don't have mathematical brains. We don't really understand the basis of a lot of statistics that are undertaken. We would hope that articles published in, in good journals will have gone through peer review, and a, lo a lot of journals have st specific statistical peer review process. So they go through a peer review process, they think the study is valid, then they'll have a, st a specialist statistician look at the study to make sure that the, that the statistics are appropriate. So to a, to a large degree, unless you have a statistical mind, we're going to have to take it on faith that the statistics used are appropriate. But the statistics in the results section will basically be in two forms. Firstly, it's descriptive statistics, so that's basically describing what animals were in the study. What was, the pop what was that sample of animals <coughs> actually made up of, so the age, the breed, and so on. So describing who was in the study. And then we have comp comparison or inferential mm -hmm. statistics where we're comparing the results from different groups. Um, and so this is where some knowledge of statistics is helpful um, and can be a bit of a, a hindrance to us uh, if we, we don't have that knowledge. So the final stage is once you've been through this process to assess the study's generalizability and applicability. So these are slightly different concepts. So if we're asking them which patients would this study to apply to in the future. So if again, if it's a study of, of a treatment of dogs with heart disease or a specific <coughs> breed of dog with heart disease, we've re read this study, we think it's a valid study, we think the, the results are useful, we can use these results in our clinical practice. Um, but we'll have to remember it for the next dog that comes through the door that has this specific disease or the specific breed that applies to this study, then we can use this study, and that's generalizability. Whereas applicability relates to a, a particular patient that you may be dealing with now. So you may have asked this question, and you may have read this study, because you have a patient you're trying to treat at the moment, you want to determine what is the best treatment for this dog with this particular type of heart disease. So you read the appropriate information, the appropriate papers. Um, and if you think it's a uh, relevant and valid study, then you can apply that information to that particular patient. So it depends on why you're reading the paper. You're just trying to keep up to date, in which case it's more related to generalizability, or you're finding a, an answer to a specific question, in which case it relates to applicability. So we need to ask these sort of questions. Do the subjects in this paper look like my own patients? Does the outcome really matter? If you've got a statistical difference between two groups, does that really matter? Does it make a difference in the clinical setting? Will it affect 
the outcomes if I use treatment A versus treatment B? And can I use these results or not? Are they useful to me? So the importance of critical evaluation, because we're trying to provide the best possible patient care and we're trying to use the best evidence out there to help us in our decisions, mm. to optimise the use of diagnostic and therapeutic tests and therapeutic <coughs> in interventions. We're trying to optimise our risk-to-benefit ratio, our cost-to-benefit ratio, uh, and provide accurate prognosis. So it is an important part of the, the practice of evidence-based medicine. So we talked a little bit about di different types of study, different designs of study. This may be obvious from the abstract or from the materials and methods. If it's not obvious in the abstract, then you again need to read the materials and methods, which will give you information about what type of study it is. If it's not clear, and since some papers you read, it won't be clear what type of study, and you don't really know, then there are toolkits available. There are toolkits available um, on the RCVS Knowledge website that allow us to uh, help us with the appraisal process. And one of these toolkits, toolkit number four, is what type of study. So it provides us with a, a study design algorithm. So we ask a series of questions when we're reading the paper, and we then come to a conclusion what that study design really is. So these are the sort of questions that it that will be there. So does the researcher have control over which animals are exposed to the intervention from the start? So we're looking more at uh, controlled trials here. Is the researcher looking for an association between variables by observing the situation or the patients without directly intervening? So these relate more to observational studies, so in epidemiological studies. Is the aim of the study to validate a test or a diagnostic tool? Or, or method, so these are diagnostic test evaluation studies, or is the aim of the study to review the literature and give advice? So these are where you uh, evidence synthesis, like systematic reviews, where the literature has been reviewed in order to answer a specific question. Wherever possible, when we're making any changes to our clinical practice, then we use, need to rely on, or hopefully use the strongest level of evidence that is available. Uh, and we'll discuss the levels of evidence in this shortly. However, we need to be, remember that all study designs are liable to errors and problems and methodological problems that can affect the validity of the study. So simply because you're, using, you're relying on systematic review, which is at the top of the evidence-based pyramid, doesn't mean that was a good study. You've still got to appraise it. There is no such thing as a perfect study. All studies have limitations. And in, in good studies, the authors will discuss those limitations in the discussion part of the paper. But, but you can't rely on the fact that it's a systematic review, that, that that's, that's the answer. Uh, you've still got to appraise how it was done and whether it's a valid study. So here's our evidence pyramid, which you'll be familiar with. So at the top, we have uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis followed by controlled, uh, randomised controlled trials. Then our observational studies, such as cohort studies, case control studies. And then lower down on the pyramid are case, uh, case series and case reports. And then at the bottom of the evidence pyramid are editorials and expert opinion. But to some degree, what level of evidence depends on the question you're asking in the first place in that study. So we can divide the, the questions asked in different studies into six main groups. That is treatment, prognosis, risk, diagnosis, prevalence, incidence. The highest level of evidence for all of those studies are going to be systematic reviews and meta-analysis. The problem in the veterinary world is there aren't many of them. So we have to rely on studies that are lower down uh, and have lower levels of evidence. So if we're interested in treatment, for example, then the next level below the systematic review are going to be randomised controlled trials. If there's no randomised controlled trial in the, relating to the particular clinical question and no systematic review, then you may have to go down that level of evidence to, to cohort studies, or even down to case reports, or even down to expert opinion. For questions related to prognosis, risk, prevalence, incidence, then you generally below the systematic review are going to be these observational studies like cohort studies, cross-sectional studies, case control studies. Um, but you can see that depending on what the question is, that really uh, the study design is important in terms of what level of evidence that, that study is likely to give you. So we'll talk a little bit about these different study devise, designs. Uh, we've already heard this morning about the Cochrane collaboration and systematic reviews. So systematic reviews use a defined and rigorous method of collating, summarising information from all published papers, hopefully, 
that address a particular clini clinical question. And they use strict methods to search the literature, to assess the quality of the literature, to make conclusions. And these are all explicitly stated in the methods section. So it's using a scientific approach to summarise the results from different studies relating to that question. Now there is a big difference between systematic reviews and narrative reviews. So where systematic reviews and say depend on standardised and rigor rigorous method methodolog methodologies to review the literature and they are provide comprehensive literature, literature searches that are formally and openly report, reported. Narrative reviews do not involve that such a strict systematic approach to literature searches and they only tend to cover a subset of studies that's, and that's based on the availability to the author or what the author decides he, wants to, he or she wants to summarise in the, in the review process. So there's immediately selection bias put into the narrative review. However, in the absence of systematic reviews, then um, narrative reviews can be really useful. They can be really informative. Um, and, but remember, they're not as robust as systematic reviews. So in the veterinary world, we can find uh, systematic reviews in a, no in a number of places. Um, the University of Nottingham Centre of Evidence Based Veterinary Medicine uh, has a, a large database of, of veterinary systematic reviews. When I looked at it earlier this week, there were 499 veterinary related systematic reviews there. It, it's, it's nothing compared to what's available in human medicine, but it is a start and it's a growing, <laughs> uh, growing number of systematic reviews available. In the equine field that I'm involved in, I own journal Equine Veterinary Education and the Equine Veterinary Journal collaborate and try and publish evidence-based material. And that's available online in this clinical evidence in, in equine practice collection. Currently on there, there's only three systematic reviews. There's more in the pipeline, but there are other types of evidence synthesis that we'll discuss. And then veterinary evidence, which is being launched by RCVS Knowledge, will be publishing systematic reviews. So in the future, there will be more and more systematic reviews available to us. So systematic reviews, I'd say this is the top level of evidence, level of evidence number one. Again, on the RCVS website, there's a, a toolkit, number 10, which allows, gives you a checklist to evaluate systematic reviews. So these are the sort of questions that we'll, you'll find there. Did the review address a clearly focused question? This is a question that you should apply pretty well to any study design. Is it clearly focused? Do you know exactly what they were trying to achieve with the study? And it applies equally to systematic reviews as it does to an experimental study. Did the author select the right papers? Do you think the search would have found all the relevant important papers? Did the authors do enough to assess the quality of the included studies? If the results of the studies had been, have been combined, was it reasonable <coughs> to do that? What are the overall results? How precise are the results? Can the results be applied to your practice? This is another question that really applies to all study designs. <laughs> Were all the important outcomes considered? Are the benefits described worth the harms and costs? So the next type of, of evidence synthesis then go under a variety of different names. Clinically appraised topics or CATs, knowledge summaries or best bets for vets. They're all similar type of uh, papers that give us again an unbiased review of current best evidence relating but much to a much more specific clinical topic, a specific clinical question that we're asking. And hopefully there's a really uh, a quick and achievable method of bringing evidence into our clinical practice. It's not as comprehensive as a, as a systematic review, but it focuses on a specific question that we may ask on a daily basis uh, as clinicians. So veterinary knowledge, as I say, I'm sorry, veterinary evidence uh, are going to publish knowledge summaries. This is one example that the editor kindly let me use to demonstrate. So I had to use a horse one. This, uh, the question here in this study is, in reported cases of iatrogenic laminitis in adult horses and ponies, so that's the population, is therapeutic administration of systemic corticosteroid, so that's the intervention, associated with the onset of laminitis, so that's the outcome. So the, the authors reviewed all the relevant papers that help, could help answer this question, 
and then come up with a clinical bottom line, which in this case was there is currently no conclusive evidence to support a causal association between systemic corticosteroid administration and the development of laminitis in healthy adult horses. But there is weak evidence of an association between the administration of multiple doses of systemic corticosteroid and the onset of laminitis in adult horses or ponies with underlying endocrine disorders or severe systemic disease. So this raises an important point relating to evidence in the veterinary sphere. So although it says there is no conclusive evidence to support a causal association between corticosteroids and laminitis, that simply means there is no evidence available. It doesn't mean there is no association. So we always need to remember, and this is particularly important in the veterinary world, where there is a dearth of, of evidence in, in many diseases that we're interested in, that the absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence. This is an example of a best bets for vets. This is from the Center of Evidence Veterinary, um, Evidence Based Veterinary Medicine from the University of Nottingham. <coughs> so this question relates to neutering and mammary tumors in bitches. So the, the, the question which is put in the PICO format is in bitches that are being spayed, so that's our patients, mm -hmm. does surgery before the first season, that's our intervention, compared to later, that's a comparison, reduce the risk of mammary tumors, that's the outcome. And again, by summarizing all the results from appropriate studies, they came up with the bottom line saying that Spain bitches before the first and second season, or before the age of two and a half years, may be associated with a reduced risk of developing mammary tumors later in life. This reduction in risk appears to be most marked in bitches spayed before the first season, followed by those spayed um, before the second season. However, the evidence is relatively weak. Here's the problem again. And this should be taken into account um, alongside other considerations when recommending whether or, uh, or when to neuter. And then this is an example from our uh, clinical evidence in equine practices, an article, uh, a cat, we call them cats in, the, in equine veterinary education that was published uh, this year. This looking at the treatment of horses with large colon impactions, important uh, clinical problem uh, for equine practices. So the question is, are intravenous fluids useful for the treatment of large colon impactions? We don't really know. A lot of people use them, a lot of people don't. So the, the, the conclusions by summarizing the results from appropriate studies was that intravenous fluids are beneficial in rehydrating the ingester in the normal and dehydrated large colon. But whether this translates to a clinical benefit in the treatment of the horse with a large colon impaction has not been established. So as they suggest that a randomized prospective clinical trial to evaluate the use of different doses of IV fluids is required. And ideally that study design would include an untreated control group, but this is not likely to be ethically uh, appropriate. So then moving away from the evidence uh, synthesis, we then have um, our experimental studies and the, the most likely one we're gonna come across in, in clinical practice will be controlled trials. They may be randomized or not. So these are intervention studies. They assess a treatment or another intervention in a population, a group, a sample of animals, uh, and generally compare that with another group that doesn't receive that treatment or intervention. So we have two groups, the study subjects, which hopefully are randomly allocated, either into an intervention group or a control group. And the control group may receive no treatment, or they may receive a placebo treatment, or they may receive what is considered to be the currently best uh, available treatment. Ideally, these groups and the, the study design will be blinded so the people that are performing the study don't know which group the animals are in, and that reduces the bias. And that's an example, just one example of a, a controlled, uh, randomized controlled trial looking at use of peroxicam uh, in treating transitional cell carcinoma. Again, there is a toolkit to, available to us when we are appraising this type of, 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 of study. Evidence Toolkit number six, and again asks is another series of questions um, which you can go through to try and appraise the article and, and come up with an, uh, some sort of decision about the validity of the study and whether it's worth reading and whether the results are likely to be helpful to you. Then we move on to the, the observational studies. These are uh, epidemiological type studies, uh, and the first one is a cohort study. So this study looks at a group of exposed and a group of unexposed uh, animals or cohorts, and you follow them over a period of time. That may be prospectively or it may be retrospectively. 
then at the end of the study period, you look at the outcomes, which may, for example, be the presence or absence of disease. And then by comparing these groups, you can identify risk factors associated with the disease. It also allows us to estimate the incidence of disease and also gives us information about prognosis. The problem with cohort studies is they're not randomised. So there's a risk of bias. And that, all, uh, incidentally, obviously, will also <coughs> apply to controlled trials that don't have randomization. And again, there's a toolkit available, toolkit number nine on the RCVS Knowledge website. It provides us a series of questions that we can answer in helping us to appraise the validity of this sort of cohort study. Then case control study is another type of observational study generally done retrospectively. So here we compare groups of animals with the disease, that is the cases, and we select a group of animals without the disease, that is the controls. And then we look at the animal's histories and we're lo really looking for risk factors that may be associated with the onset of disease. This case control study have a lower level of evidence generally than cohort studies because they are more susceptible to to bias, but they can be really useful, especially for rare diseases, looking for risk factors as to why the disease occurs. And again, on the RCVS website, there's a toolkit here that allows us to um, appraise um, the validity of case control studies. Then cross-sectional studies, this is the, 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 uh, the other main type of observational study. Uh, it's done differently to the cohort and case control in that you, you look at the population of animals at a single point in time and you then identify diseased and non-diseased groups. You can use it to determine prevalence of disease and also to identify odds ratios, that is relationships within the disease or non-disease groups to specific parameters. But they lack the temporal sequence um, of cohort and case control studies, so it's much more difficult to demonstrate effectively a cause-effect link. Um, but they can provide valuable evidence of risk factors, to say. And again, there, there are toolkits available to allow us to assess and appraise the validity of cross-sectional studies. Then, of course, we have case series and case reports. These are much lower down, as we said, in the, the level of evidence. They are disc purely descriptive studies. They talk about presentation, diagnosis, treatment, outcome, either of a group of animals or a single animal. But there are no comparators. There's no disease-free animals to compare with. So any differences in management are, cannot, are, are not randomly allocated. So without a comparison group, it's really difficult to establish any cause or effect or to be assured <coughs> whether any treatment or intervention hadn't made any difference whatsoever to the animals. But in the absence of other types of study, this may be the only evidence that you can find on the specific disease. And likewise, expert opinion and consensus statements. This is just individuals' opinions, either one individual's opinion or a, a position reached by a panel of experts to answer the question of interest, not necessarily supported by any clinical research data. So it's low down on the evidence uh, level, um, but it can provide us with useful information when we have nothing else. So going back to this diagram we, we mentioned at the start, it's important to remember that evidence-based medicine doesn't rely wholly on e external evidence. It can't because we don't have external <coughs> evidence in a lot of areas. It relies on the integration of all of the, these three areas, so individual clinical expertise and our patient and client values and expect expectations. So we have to, to accept the fact that in, for some areas, for some questions we have, there will be very limited or there may be no external evidence. Um, so we can't obsess ourselves on external evidence. Uh, and, and this is just a light-hearted way of expressing that. This is a study, uh, a paper that was published in the British Medical Journal a few years ago. So the title of this is Parachute Use and to Prevent Death and Major Trauma Related to Gravitational Challenge. That is, what happens if you fall out of an aeroplane? A systematic review of randomized controlled trials. So the objectives were to determine whether parachutes are effective in preventing major trauma related to gravitational challenge. It was a systematic review of randomized controlled trials. They described how they found their, their data from these uh, databases. They studied selection studies, uh, they selected studies that showed an effects of using a parachute during free fall. And the main outcome was death or major trauma, defined as injury or severity score greater than 15. Unfortunately, in the results, they were unable to identify any randomised controlled trial of parachute intervention. 
so their conclusions were, so as with many interventions intending to prevent ill health, the effectiveness of parachutes has not been subjected to rigorous evaluation by using randomized controlled trials. So advocates of evidence-based medicine have criticized the adoption of interventions uh, evaluated only by using observational data. So they suggest that everyone might benefit if the most radical protagonists of evidence-based medicine organized and participated in a double trial, double blind, randomized, placebo-controlled crossover trial of the parachute. Okay, so just to finish up, I was going to mention um, journal clubs. So journal clubs are a really helpful, I think, way of linking research and clinical research with clinical practice. And it allows us it helps us to actually apply and practice evidence-based veterinary medicine. <coughs> so there are a number of advantages of holding journal clubs. It helps us to keep abreast of, of our relevant literature. We're all faced with, with knowledge and literature overload. We all can't all read all papers that come out that may be relevant. But by selecting appropriate papers and then discussing them in a, in a journal club situation, it allows us to think about and, and keep up to date with the most important uh, current research. It's also really useful, I think, in networking of colleagues. So especially in big practice where there's a large number of vets and nurses, they all go away and do their own thing and they often don't talk together. But it brings everybody together, whatever their level, whether it be a senior partner or the first uh, uh, trainee nurse. It can bring everybody together to discuss issues of importance to the practice or to the institute that you're working in, or to the whatever area of um, specialization or area of clinical interest that you have. It helps us develop critical appraisal skills, and I've seen these as important in how we apply evidence-based medicine. It promotes ac academic debate, which can never be a bad thing. And it helps us in the practices to generate practice guidelines to consider uh, its assistance or help in developing clinical audits. So there are lots of advantages in using journal clubs. We can do them as face-to-face -face meetings, which is what we do, um, or they can be online. There are a number of online journal clubs out there, depending on what uh, interests you have. The important thing is to, true is to try and hold them at regular intervals. And it's important to try and set them at times that are convenient to participants. Now, that's a tall order. We're all busy in most practices. People are busy. They don't have much time. Finding a time that's convenient to everyone is virtually impossible. But if you set the time on a regular basis, you'll find that people who are interested will, uh, will find the time to attend. The participants need to share a common clinical interest. So if it's in a practice, you're all basically sharing the same common clinical interest. If, you have a, if, you're, in a, if you're a specialist, then you may want to develop journal clubs concentrating on those special, specialist areas. Some people suggest that you need a facilitator, especially someone with research experience who will help guide and the discussion about papers. I'm not sure that that's necessary. We don't do that in our own journal club in our practice. We all just so in our, our opinions about papers uh, and it works but the, the articles really need to be relevant in order to encourage people to attend they need to see the relevance of it so you need to try and choose articles that you think are going to appeal to people you need to circulate those articles well ahead of time and that's easy these days using internet or email or whatever and if you're having a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, meeting then uh, consider having food available it encourages people to attend in terms of how you actually run the journal club, we, we'd normally try and follow these nine points. So you, you introduce, a, so whoever's discussing the, the, the paper introduces it. So say, why have you chosen this paper? What's its relevance to us? Discuss the title and the authors. D describe what the hypothesis or question is, it, ideally in the PICO format. And then appraise the evidence base of what is already known about this subject. What, what is this paper going to add to what we already know? And then we appraise the paper so, paper, so we'd look at the study design, the study type, the population, the randomization or not, the bias, inclusion, exclusion criteria. So really go through the appraisal process uh, related to this paper. Decide whether you think the method is thorough, whether the results are going to be valid, uh, and then discuss the results and then have an overall discussion and interpretation. Look at the strengths and weaknesses of this paper. And then finally, and most importantly, try and put it into clinical context. So if you think it is a valid, useful study, then discuss how you might incorporate this into your own practice. 
Uh, and at the end of the day, this is how um, evidence-based medicine should work, in that we're getting this external evidence, so information, and then incorporating <coughs> it into our daily practice and our clini daily clinical decision-making. And uh, yeah, so in summary then, <coughs> The clinical, sorry, critical appraisal of papers is an important part of evidence-based medicine and important part of practicing evidence-based medicine. These five elements I find really useful when appraising a, a, a study. So look at the research question, the design of the study, try and assess the validity or the, whether you believe the results, then assess the study results and then assess how you're going to use that information in terms of its generalizability and applicability. You need to be familiar with study design and types of study uh, and try and incorporate this process into journal clubs. It's a really useful <coughs> way of linking research and clinical practice, and keeping up to date, appraising current literature uh, and integration of new ideas into practice. Um, thank you, that's it, I think. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions, there's a microphone uh, circulating. I'll try and answer anyone. Um, can I just ask you to put back the slide where you, there was the different level of uh, evidence for the different kind of question, please? You want to go back to that slide? Let's try. I could do it quicker, couldn't I? Yes. <laughs> no, I did, sorry. Where was it? We'll get there. <coughs> that one? Yes. <laughs> Did you have a question or you just wanted? <laughs> Any other questions or comments people have? Go for it. How do you encourage the less um, academic people in your practice to start taking part and not be afraid to join in with the journal club? Okay. Um, so the way we've worked in our practice, which works really well for us, is that uh, it works best because we're a hospital and we have people and we, we time it early in the morning, so we have them at about 7.30. We do it on a weekly basis. And we also have lots of students, and students are really great because they're all now trained in critical appraisal skills. So we tend to use students a lot to actually choose a paper, depending on cases they've seen recently, and then <coughs> present it at Journal Club. Um, and th I think the trick is to try and get papers that people are going to be interested in. Um, it's open to everybody. Anybody can come. So nurses, vets, stable staff, anybody who is interested in a particular paper are uh, welcome to attend. Um, I would have to say that not everyone attends by any means, but we found since we've been doing it for several years that more and more people tend to come these days as they see the usefulness, I guess, of the, of the journal club. I don't force people to come. It has to be a voluntary thing, otherwise it won't work. Um, so I don't have any answer to your question, I'm afraid. It just seems to work for us. I, maybe a show of hands. How many people here do run journal clubs? Are you all from practice, or I don't know where everybody's from, but not many. Okay. I think it, in, in a practice situation, it, it, for us it works really well. It, it's, it's good fun as well. And it, it really stimulates discussion, which you otherwise wouldn't have. So. Have you critically appraised um, your journal club? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, <coughs> no, but we certainly should. Certainly should. I can think of, se of several papers where we have changed what we do as a result. But I must expect we haven't really audited that or haven't uh, looked to, to assess what impact that's had and whether it's positive or negative. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Agree.
So it's really only a comment about practice meetings and sort of clinical clubs, which we do a little bit of this journal, journal review, but more on a clinical club type basis, is that we very often assume being in a big practice with sort of 28, 30 vets, that everybody's singing from the same song sheet and it can be very illuminating having these sort of meetings. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, <coughs> when I say discussion, sometimes it turns into a bit more than that. Um, so uh, I can't remember when I mentioned this in this talk or the last talk, but we, we had a journal club yesterday and we were looking at a paper um, assessing a treatment for a condition in horses called overriding dorsal spinous processes or kissing spines. Um, and we have people who have in the journal club there who have a surgical bend who were quite keen on this treatment because it was a surgical treatment and obviously they're <coughs> surgeons, they want to do surgery. And there are people that maybe have a more medical bend or and think, well, actually this paper is rubbish. Um, it didn't describe how they made the diagnosis, for example. Uh, it didn't describe the surgical technique in any, any detail. Um, there were lots of flaws in the paper, but of course the surgeon thought it was great because it kind of gives more evidence to them to support what they want to do. Whereas other people, it was rubbish and it gives them more support. So, and that encourages a certain amount of debate and um, different differences of opinion. Yeah. It's all good fun. Okay, that's it. Thank you.